Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It came by now. Maybe. Yeah. Was it you? Got better when I disconnected, right? Does the access point have a client yeah, limit? It's like five people and it starts. <laughs> or does Jitsi have a limit? Uh, what is it? It's a mess. Uh, what's, the, what's the new one? The, the, the mesh, the HDs. It's one of those. Oh, is it the Unify system? It's Unify, yeah. Oh, Unify sensor jump. I'm not horrible, horrible stuff. For the price, you cannot. You cannot, yeah. Though I have been looking at, um, well, I guess, but damn, they It's expensive, expensive yeah. Because specifically, I was looking at the CapWap um, and the um, tunneling back to the controller when mm -hmm. we were seamless roaming between access point. Yeah. And after you get the controller and the access point, you, you know, for something like self, you'd be, be looking at 10 grand. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, because. Where did you get a VIM sticker? Because it would be. Uh, sticker room. Let's see. It, the yeah, controller was like one. three grand. Oh. Um, and then each access point would be five to six hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. Nah. But I mean that yeah. that that, that uh, seamless uh, roaming between APs weeks when you do the towing the traffic back to the controller because then you, uh, the problem uh, with roaming with the Unify yeah. is yeah. you have to sure. redo ARP every time mm -hmm. you change your change yeah. AP. Yeah. But with uh, all the tunnel mile traffic being towed back, you don't have to. Yeah. So it does make for a vastly faster roaming. I tried that. Yeah. Yeah, but you probably got all the access points and everything you've got itself. You probably got less than two grand in it. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! The access points and switches. I think I got, I got fifteen APs. Oh, you got fifteen APs. Okay. Yeah, I got fifteen okay. APs and five switches. Okay. So you got four, five, maybe. So how I did that? And two of the APs are the HDs. I'm just I'm one XG, my but phone, I, my phone doesn't have a way. I can just buy seven hundred bucks for an XG. Yeah. Wow. But I'm, I'm Nana, a, there's, yeah, there's a Nano HD here. There's one of the regular HDs on the other side, on the tenant side. <laughs> one of the um, <laughs> that was computers, yeah, yeah, I, I, those I, HDs over I've there. I've got two of those <laughs> Nano HD, five or six Pros, but um, on a couple of lights um, and, and everything and, all the other and, lights. Okay, so and then um, so a, um, a couple of the mesh outdoor units. Know, the stuff I there. On there. It, basically, it's, a lot of them are my home network. So, so when I pack up myself, I basically oh, tear gosh. down my entire home network, throw it in my car, and drag it to sell. Mm. All right, Ben, what time you got? Um, 7.31. I think someone needs just a clock. <laughs> yeah, that's Columbia time. <laughs> Columbia time or Columbia time? <laughs> Columbia time, yeah. So you're, you're going to be starting the recording or what? How, how do you do this? Uh, it's, it's, it's already recording. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Well, then I'll just say hello, everybody, and welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you, the new people and the old faces and and, and me and stuff. Um, so tonight we have Bash Bunny Basics by Caleb Faulkner. Thank you so much for bringing the stuff. This is going to be really cool. A lot of fun. Um, anything you'd like to say, Ben, to start us off? No. All right, then I'll let Caleb take it away. All right, so my name is Caleb Faulkner. This is Bash Money Basics, uh, an introduction to bad USB devices in general. So they're not just covering just the Bash Money, but there'll be some information about uh, other US bad USB devices. So what are bad USB devices to start with? They're, uh, they attack computers over USB, simply. You plug it in, it does something bad to the computer. Um, that's just how they work. Uh, different physical, uh, different physical, Devices exist to do this. Uh, modified flash drives are one of the earlier ways to do this. You can get a flash drive with a certain controller and flash it, and then it would be able to do, uh, execute uh, programs off of its storage. Um, purpose built devices such as the Bash Bunny, the Rubber Ducky, and the Maldowino, these are all uh, bad USB devices that all have different abilities and things that they can do. 
A couple of DIY options. So you could use a phone, uh, OnePlus One and Nexus Five, things like that, and put CyanogenMod on it or Lineage OS and install something called Cali Net Hunter. It allows you to do most of the functionality of the rubber ducky. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce the Raspberry Pi Zero W thing. I don't know if they're trying to call it Pond Pi or Home Pi or what, but it allows you to turn a Raspberry Pi Zero W into a bagged USB device and you can connect to it over Wi-Fi and then inject keystrokes that way. Um, and the point of these is that they're hard to detect, they're quick. You plug them in, they do their job, and you walk off with credentials, you walk off with uh, a reverse shell, stuff like that. So how do these work? They exploit the trust that we give USB devices. Um, if you have a keyboard hooked up to a computer, you know, it's kind of the only way you can do things with it unless you're SSHing and you disable all of the uh, USB ports. But that doesn't work for client machines, so you can always have a way in. Uh, you do this by emulating keyboards commonly. That's the most common way that they do this. Uh, keyboards, um, some of them emulate other devices as well. Anything that that device can do, it can also do. So if you plug in, you have a user that has administrative rights in that machine, now that your bad USB has administrative rights. Um, they do require physical access. And I'm not talking about a USB killer. A USB killer is a device that you plug in, it builds up an electric charge, and then it releases the electric charge back into the computer, killing the computer or killing the USB uh, interface. It's a great way to piss off school, school districts. School districts, yeah. <laughs> um, what is the bash point specifically? It can emulate more than just the keyboard. It can do gigabit Ethernet driverlessly on Windows, Mac, and Linux. It can give a serial um, connection to get a prompt on the bash phone itself. It can be flash storage and keyboard. It can do multiple of these at once. So if you want to, you can be a flash drive and a keyboard or any other combination of these devices. Um, and it has a really large library of payloads. So you can use um, payloads from the Bash Bunny, or you can use payloads from the Rubber Ducky. The Rubber Ducky has a lot more payloads than the Bash Bunny does. And it takes advantage of very simple scripting language, which we'll get into later. I have a lot of information on the scripting languages. Uh, it runs a full Debian Linux box. It runs uh, Debian 8, and you can get into the command line, update it, you can install packages, all the normal things you could expect to do with Linux. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, is there a relationship between Bash Bunny and Rubber Ducky? Yes, uh, Bash Bunny and the Rubber Ducky are made by the same company. Gotcha. Uh, the Rubber Ducky is the little brother to the Bash Bunny, is how I think about it. And it has a seven second boot time. Uh, that's, if you watch any of the videos of people who make this, they will not shut up about that. <laughs> um, this is the specs that the Bash Bunny has. It has a quad core ARM Cortex A7 at 1.6. It's similar to what's in the Raspberry Pi 2. It's clocked a lot higher. I think the Raspberry Pi 2 is at 900 megahertz or something. Uh, it has half a gig of RAM and an SSD, um, effectively. Uh, Three-way switch and an LED, and there's a picture of it on the bottom of the screen. And that is what it looks like. It's supposed to be conspicuous. It's a little bit bigger than a normal USB drive would be. Uh, here's where all of my information has come from and where it will be coming from. The wiki, um, payloads, and forums. Forums, you can ask questions on. People seem to be very friendly. They also have a Discord, which is where the forums seem to have moved. So the switches have two different purposes. There's an army mode and payloads. What army mode allows you to do is manage the bash money. Um, it allows you to update, manage, access to storage, access to serial um, prompt, and it doesn't run any scripts. So you plug it in, you don't have to worry about it doing something bad to your machine. Um, payloads, uh, it automatically runs a payload file that is inside of these, and we'll see the file structure in the file directory in a second. Um, connecting to it, you can do it via serial, and this is the information you would need to use it in something like Putty. Or, and the default settings for it are username, which is just root, password, attack5, IP addresses, and the DHCP range. It 
has a DHCP server running on it, so it gives your computer an IP address, and then it can attack it through that IP address using a Latin map or something. Uh, there's two ways to update the batch money. Um, method one is to download the firmware, put it on the, uh, make sure your checksum's good, plug in the batch money once in ARM mode, copy the files to the root directory, and you have to make sure you safety eject it because if the file's not done copying, you will break the device because it'll try to update itself anyway. And then you just replug it in and wait for the LEDs to finish flashing red and uh, blue and it's done. And then method two for Linux, which is a little bit harder to get done than the Windows version or the Mac OS version, but it's still not hard, is you download an updater and then go to where the updater is and set the bunny path and then it looks for the rubber donkey, I mean for the bash bunny. Um, if you run this, if you run the updater multiple times, it'll automatically download the payloads off of their GitHub. And if you want to update them, you can just run the script again to update them. <coughs> this is the file structure when you plug it in as a USB storage device. Uh, documents is just for the documentation. That's where a copy of essentially what's all of the wiki is on. Uh, language, this is how you add different keyboard layouts to it. So if you want to attack a keyboard that's not in US English, you could attack something in German or whatever by putting in new uh, layouts in there. Loot is where uh, the logs for the payloads that you run store. So this would be like passwords or a file that have all the information that you're trying to steal or things like that. Um, Payloads, this is home to all the payloads. Uh, this is just a file, so you can manage all of that. This is where you spend most of the time. Uh, payload switch one and two is where you put your text.payloads. You just stick the file called text.payload and it automatically executes that file. And it makes it easy for you to access the other files using some helpers. Uh, payloads library is a library of the rest of the payloads. This is where that Git repository lives. And then extensions are uh, there to extend the language that you're trying to, to extend BunnyScript, which we'll get into a lot in a minute. This is the RGB LED and the switch for it. Um, custom payload, the middle is payload two, all the way to the front near the USB is arming mode. That's how you make sure you don't do something bad. These are some similar devices, the rubber ducky and the Malbina. Uh, both of these only do keyboard, so they're not as versatile, but they do have an advantage of that they instantly boot. If you plug it in, it generally takes a second or so for the computer to realize there's a flash drive plugged in, so normally you run a delay, but it instantly boots, you plug it in, it starts executing as that, right after it's plugged in. Um, the rubber ducky only has one payload, but can push that payload out with microSD. <laughs> Surprised that everyone was Debian. The uh, Malvino is run a clone of Debian. It has something to be as light as you want it, like Gen 2. But yeah, um, compile all that stuff. It also has uh, the ability, it has some div switches. It's the picture of the black PCB up top. It, uh, those div switches, if you represent different payloads in binary, it runs different files. So if you have it set to all ones, then it runs payload 1111 or payload 16. Um, you can represent up to 16 different things. So now if you have two SD cards, you have 32 payloads. Yay. Uh, bunny script. So what is bunny script exactly? If you know bash, you know bunny script. That's all it is. It's bash with helper functions. These helper functions are used to control the hardware that the bash bunny has, so you can control the LED, the mode that it's in, say if it's in ethernet mode or if it's in storage mode, the vendor and product ID, you can change what the device shows up and what it looks like as, and you can get the switch position, so you can see what where you are on the switch. Um, and you can also call it Ducky script for keyboard injection. So these are what the commands look like, they're just in all caps. <laughs> So attack mode specifies USB device and what combination of USB devices you're trying to emulate. Uh, LED, so the important part about LED is that 
You can set whatever color you want, but they have standard states. So if you want to set up, say, if the payload failed, there's two or three ways of saying the payload failed. Um, and those are all just standard, so all the payloads look the same. You have a standard way of interacting with the payloads. Quack is for keyboard injection. Um, <laughs> type quack or press or type Q, and then anything after that is keyboard injection. Uh, Ducky Lang just sets the language of the keyboard, and it's decently, it's pretty important because you're using the wrong keyboard, it doesn't work at all. So the extensions augment the bunny scripting functionality so that it has new commands and other things. So for instance, run is a command that was implemented really early on. And what it does is it says, hey, run when. What that'll do is that'll open up a run prompt in Windows. So it just presses uh, Windows or Super and R. In Mac OS, I'm not sure what it opens. I didn't have a uh, Mac to try it on. And run Unity, it still says Unity. It should say no now, but it uh, opens up a uh, F2 uh, run command. Um, Git is another one. What it allows you to do is get uh, variables from the bash bunny. So things like the target's IP address, you can get the target's IP address and then use that in say nmap or something like that to see what ports are open. Um, get the host name, that's, you can use that to name the folder so that you know what host it came off of, for instance. Uh, host IP, that is the IP of the bash bunny so you know where you are. And uh, get switch position, just get the switch position and that can be used, I have an example of that in a minute of where I have a payload that actually uses it. A uh, required tool, this is make sure you have this dependency. There are some third-party tools that you can install like Metasploit and uh, a couple of other tools. And if it requires a tool in your script, you want to set this early, that way it fails out and you know what the issue is. It has a special uh, red light to make sure that you know why it failed. And then I have Ducky Lane again. Here are all the attack modes. You can do multiples of these. I think you can do pretty much any combination of these except for off. Off is only on its own. Um, serial gives you a serial connection. ECM Ethernet, that gives you Ethernet connection or uh, the driver for Linux, Mac, and Android. Uh, RDNIS is for Windows, and that gives you a uh, driverless uh, Ethernet adapter on Windows and works on some Linux devices, but not all of them. You more than likely will always want to use uh, ECM for it. Uh, storage just shows a flash drive. HID is for keyboard injection. And off is so if you want to delay the uh, setting of your attack mode, you can wait till later and then set it. So if you want to run something and then set it later. So here's an example of a Bash Bunny script. Um, this is how they look. Same. This is how they look normally when you get them from the uh, repo. So the top just has title, author, version, and then what it does, and then the lights. Um, this is an older one, so it doesn't just use standard lights. It uses um, whatever this person wanted them to be at the top. The configuration options are R host and R port, and this is a reverse shell. The point of this is so you can get a shell on a Linux computer. Um, this is one of my examples that may not work depending on uh, what class network this is, uh, because the Bash Bunny uses, um, was it 172 as the uh, DHS server, and that ends up messing with it, so it doesn't run on those. And that is, you can change it, but it takes a little bit of effort to do. So I got a question: How is how is this actually going to work on a Linux box if it's not logged in? that you can't just add a network adapter because it's hard to set in NetPlan or IF config or something like that. So how, how, you, how is this actually gonna work? So the idea behind it is you get physical access um, to mostly like Windows boxes is what's made mostly to attack. And you can unlock Windows boxes with it. I actually have a demo with that later. Um, it doesn't work as well as Linux. It's made to go after say like the front desk or something like that. It's not made to go plug into a server where all the ports are disabled and it's hard to do. Um, there are some Linux things. This is one of two I could find that actually worked on Linux, and I mostly tried to find those because. But this, 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 this works because it you found a machine 
that had a logged in session yes. already. Yes. So, 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 so it wouldn't bypass the login prompt. You can learn on a keystroke logger on it, I think. Probably good, yes. Yeah. So yeah. You can, I guess you can plug it in and wait for a password. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, like most servers don't actually, you don't actually get console on them very often. Um, and then in the script, it just says set up LED, and then you're trying to get the switch position. Uh, then you set the attack mode, which is just HID and storage, because in this case, we want to be a keyboard and we want to be storage. Up top, it says get switch position again. I have no idea why it says that. <laughs> um, I copied this from the repository and it was like that. I just left it. Um, open a terminal, and this would be in something like Ubuntu, where the default is control alt to open a terminal. Uh, sleep for a second, then put the stage one LEDs, then this long string down here. What it does is it uh, copies a it copies in a uh, shell script over to the target machine into the home directory, and then it gives it execution, and then it runs it and passes it our host to our ports. Um, so then it reverse shells back to the uh, target to the attacker computer using those. Then quick terminal, it just sets up a cleanup LED, types exit, and presses enter. So this is DuckyScript. DuckyScript is uh, very simple. You have to think in like keystrokes. So it is only keystroke injection, but you can also use this on the rubber ducky, I mean on the bash bunny. Uh, for the rubber ducky, it has to be compiled. So if you were to get a rubber ducky, you have to have a program. It then turns that into something that the rubber ducky can understand. Uh, it can be used in bunny script just by calling flack or Q. Here are some of the commands. I didn't list them all because they're pretty self-explanatory. If you want to RDM is comment, delay is wait, and then you a thousand would be a second. Uh, string just types out the following uh, characters. GUI presses the window or the super key. Menu is right click, and then shift, alt, control, down, left, right, up. Uh, those all just press the keyboard. So those are pretty simple. This is what it looks like. It's really simple. Um, delay 2000, that's the wait so it sees that it's a USB drive. Then GUIR opens run, delay for a second, then type in notepad, delay for another second, press enter. You can make that way shorter. It just left it like that. Uh, enter, and then delay, and then type string hello world. You could easily make something malicious out of this for Windows if you just change string to CMD or PowerShell and put something bad where hello world is. <coughs> that assumes that it is unlocked. And we're into the demos. So these are the demos I'm going to be showing off. The one that may not work based off of whether or not the network uh, will end up working is the reverse shell. Um, I was going to set up another one for Windows, but it ended up having to be compiled. It is cross-platform. It is very nice, but I didn't quite understand how to set it up. So I didn't do that. So the first one we're going to be looking at Looking at is how do you do a serial connection on it? So it's pretty simple to actually get a shell on the uh, bash bunny. So when you plug it in, you get a green LED. Um, you wait a few seconds, it takes seven seconds. They keep talking about how it takes seven seconds. Um, and then you get a magenta. The magenta means it's in startup, blue means you're good. So now it will show up as a USB device, and it should be USB storage now. So here it is. This is what it looks like. This is the file directory I was talking about earlier. Um, uh, you're in arming mode? Yes, this is in arming mode. OK. So this means that it's not going to do anything bad. So over here, I already have the command for uh, connecting to it to be a, a serial. So there's a script you can find that will find it, but it's almost always called GTY ACMO. And then I'm using screen. Asking for my password. And you get a login prompt. And then you get some ASCII art, and you have a terminal on the batch button. <laughs> so from here, you can do say CD to the root, and it's just a normal Linux machine. Um, you can do things like update it and stuff like this, but. I just figured I'd show you all that you could do things like this. Uh, you can also set up your own 
Uh, you can install different packages and things to it, but most of the tools that are supported are in a tools folder um, that you can download from back from the wiki. So that's cool. And the first actual payload that I'm going to be showing is called SMB Brute Force, and that is going to be attacking a Windows machine. Um, this is a brute force attack, so it doesn't do anything smart. All it does is have a dictionary and usernames and attacks them over SMB. It does not use SMB version 1, which is what something I thought it was going to end up using. So it does use something else. Um, so it's not as bad. It does have to have the port open, obviously, for that to work. And all right, so you're on, you're on the other machine. Yep, yeah, and I'm on the other machine now. So, for a time, I'm bad. so how do I make that one? Go? <clears throat> and any good domain machine, after five attempts, your, your account would be locked for some time. Well, I can't seem to. Whoop. There we go. Okay. All right, so I'm showing the, the laptop. So you can see the batch running down here. Um, it went green. Then after that, it'll get a magenta color. Magenta means it's setting up. It should take a few seconds for that to happen. And then yellow means it's attacking. So right now, it's trying to brute force passwords and stuff like that. So just keep it open and keep it clicked to make sure it types it out properly. And I'm guessing most of y'all could probably guess what the password is on this. If y'all could read it, it's B Wayne. So. We had passwords for seconds. It says I have no idea. So it's like Yes. Uh, there's one that there's another one called Jackalope that uses uh, Metasploit as its uh, way of doing it. And I this one seems to be faster. So. So it didn't look like it's temp. Oh, and it has to be ten. You can't lose the screen like that, right? If it, um, you can set it up so it would like press a button first, okay. and then it would just automatically do it. But I don't have it set up so it'll do that. So it doesn't look like it's typing anything in the the dialog there. Is it, is that what it's doing? It's attacking over Ethernet. Gotcha. So it's doing a. Uh, so it's trying to brute force the password. Through SMB, is that right? Yes. Oh, right. And. But if this was a corporate environment, AD would step in and, and lock the account. Yeah. Also, if you plug into a Windows machine with certain antivirus, uh, yeah. it will get very mad and start saying that everything on the USB is terrible. So, there's some issues. Does, does the Windows Defender do it? Windows Defender does not. Windows Defender does not care. That's a common one. I know it uh, advanced uh, detects it, and it's uh, it gets very angry, and it says that everything in it is bad, um, especially if you have executables. You can also use this thing to put executables onto a machine and execute those. Um, Right now, I'm just hoping it's on the right payload because normally it doesn't take this long. <laughs> normally, it's extremely quick because it has a small dictionary. Since I know the password, it's mostly just the demo. So the yellow flashing ring is it still working? Yes, it's still in some kind of attack. I have two attacks on this. One is a attack to portal. One is a uh, one is the SMB brute force. So if it's attacking over Ethernet, why would you need to have the actual Login prompt available. So after it attacks it for Ethernet, what it does is it it's saves like that system. and then types it in. Ah. And I'm trying to make sure I have the right payload in here real quick. I'm gonna have to switch up payloads in a second, so that's also the other thing. I was hoping I could get the other one that's broken working, but it's not gonna happen. So what about if uh if you have a machine that has a policy to not allow uh, any activity in you plug in the thumb drive and it doesn't do anything. Would it still try to execute something if there's a policy? If it has power, it would try, but it wouldn't get very far. Okay, let's try the other switch because there's nothing having the wrong one. So 
you've tried this payload and you've seen it working. Yes, I've seen this payload work. <laughs> and it's pretty easy to get working. So, assuming it's the same laptop. The same laptop. You've had it on a wireless network. I don't have this connected to anything, and I have had it on the wireless network and not connected to anything. Okay, so it's just it should sitting work. there idle. Nice. Nope, but with local off. Hmm. Do they offer any like options or like a harness that if you want to have it booted ahead of time, you can give it like no power? So this definitely wouldn't be good for like a start on boot, some sort of exploit that requires. Yeah, it, it, it needs power to be able to boot its own system before. Yes. It. Okay. Right. Oh, looks like locked in. Yep. Oh, I missed yeah. it. Yeah. Do it again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You had the wrong payload before? Yes, I had the wrong payload on before. I had it on the wrong switch. And every time after that, it's a lot quicker. It does store the password. So this time it should be almost instant. It's after, after it boots. After it boots. Yeah. Seven it's seconds. Seven seconds. <laughs> Only seven seconds. So, at the if you have a good password policy plus a lockout policy, then this would be pretty easily yes. created. Yeah, this would be useless. Yep. To any kind of enterprise environment, like you said, is going to happen. Now, now the lockout policies that get on my nerves is that you must call IT to get it unlocked. Those are obnoxious. And they also have the, I don't know if it's the, the Malduinos or the rubber, the rubber duckies with the Wi-Fi on so you can change your attacks on the fly. Oh, oh, or green. There we go. Oh, oh. Uh, nice. nice. And that's one payload. The other one is going to be Capture Portal. Uh, Capture Portal. Is just a uh, um, all Capture Portal does is it says, "Hey, uh, all the DNS stuff that you're trying to do, I'm doing that now. I am now who you're trying to pass that through." And so sending it to you, uh, the website you're trying to go to, it just gives you Capture Portal like you would at like a hotel or something like that. Basically, man, in the middle of that. yeah, it's man all time. So then you'd get Capture Portal, you'd have a username and password, you could fancy this up with some HTML and things like that. Or Welcome to the whatever login page. page. Please yeah. sign in. Yep. So and then what this does is if you type in a password, yeah. so I'm Batman or whatever. <laughs> what? uh, well, and the other thing <laughs> is because it's doing DNS yeah. interception, it can bypass the checks. Like LastPass will check the domain, mm -hmm. and, it, and if it doesn't match, it won't right. fill. But because you control DNS, you can yeah. fix that. Thank you. Fast is so loud. <laughs> That's why I do not have five six. What? <laughs> no, I think six won't help here. But it also won't hurt here. No, I said. Hey, hey Caleb, we got a question. Okay. Oh, uh, the question was do you have to have it unplugged to change the attack modes? So it'll boot in the new attack mode, or can yes, you just you switch over? Yes, you do. Some payloads will have a uh, yes. Some payloads will have a cleanup script that if you switch the payload, it'll delete or do something with the files that'll get rid of them, or it'll switch to a different mode. Um, but yes, generally you have to unplug it in order to switch what mode it's in. So in order to switch it back to uh, arming mode, I had to unplug it and replug it to get back in arming mode so I could show the loop that is from um, wrong file. So this is what uh, SMB brute force does. Um, ends up with a user list. This is user list I start off with. This is the pass list that I start off with. And then this would be the credentials for the machine. It has the machine's name, user, and uh, the password for it. In this case, it didn't encrypt. Um, here would be all the information that it got while it was doing it. And then for the other payload, um, 
Here is the capture. Um, that was what it would, would have captured. Uh, I tried this once earlier and I mistyped it, but yeah. So those are two of the payloads. Um, the Linux reverse show, I'm not sure if it'll end up working because of how the network's set up here. Um, and the other payload that I have to show is uh, USB uh, extraction, which is assuming that the device is unlocked, like most of these end up being. I have to switch the payload real quick. Okay, and that's all it takes to switch out payloads most of the time. Um, this one comes with the readme. You can read it and see what optional configuration. And this one, what it will be doing is trying to grab all of the PDFs and document files from uh, desktop downloads and document folder. And then switch cameras. Looking for the payroll information. Yep. So you, you recently for an attack like that, you want a quick file, so you don't want to yes. wait like oh, you know, so an hour to download images yes. for the files. So you want yeah. quick text files, grab them, not text files, but PDF. So and you can grab pretty quick. Okay. It only it's also only has eight gigs of swords, so right. we're kind of limited by that. There's a similar script for this on um, the uh, Rust Rocky that does almost the same thing. But uh, you can change out your SD card, so you can even make it bigger if you need to. But I wouldn't really see a reason to most of the time. And you gotta go to this one. So USB 2.0 or 3.0? Uh, I think it's USB 2.0. It came out in 2011, so I assume it would be. This that was probably came out in 11. Yes, it came out in 2011. I think. Or is the rubber ducky came out in 2011? Well, I'm kind of been around a while. This I just heard about this year. This has been a couple of years. I, but I, but bad USB has been around for a little while. So what this payload does is it tries to extract files. It brings a run. It runs it, and it should have just grabbed all of the files. It's only one file, so it didn't take long at all. Um, but it gets the point across, and it does bring it up as a USB device. You can actually turn this off if you want to. I left this on because it makes it easier to show what happened. So the documents folder, I only have one document on computers, this is a thing, and it's Batman Comics, and it's the name of the user is B. Wang. Um, just stuck with that theme throughout. And in the loop, you, you have USB extraction, and then the name of the desktop, and then the comic. Uh, one of these was from earlier when I tried this payload to make sure it worked. So then you have your Batman comic, or your payroll, or whatever you want, or whatever was on the device. So, so those, um, the last version I'm not able to show off because I do not think it will work whatsoever. And the last one that I have is Information Grabber. Um, this one is actually a Linux one. This is the other one that I got to end up working relatively easily on Linux, so I have to reboot into that, which may take a minute. Um, so, yeah. A little bit down how I'm user data folder. <laughs> I'm you <too. laughs> so, so it sounds like you just stick a couple ISOs in your home in your home folder and put PDF at the end. <laughs> Watch you try to copy that. <laughs> that, that, that four gig ISO. <laughs> That's a good idea, actually. Just have it there just as a trip. just in case. Yeah, just in case. So oh, it looks like a lot of the exploits were kind of Manipulating UI. Yeah. I, I yes. guess you could script it if you wanted to, just run it from a prompter. 
move something off screen so that you could type without it looking, you know. Yes, you can move things around, you can move UI uh, things off, um, you can open some things in that quiet mode, stuff like that. There's some things you can get around. Well, if you can get a reverse shell, then it doesn't matter. Yeah, like I said, that doesn't matter. Right? <laughs> the reverse shell I didn't get working, which made me sad, is actually encrypted. So it's kind of nice. Uh, it's an encrypted reverse shell that works on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and it can point back to anywhere. Uh, or at least that's the idea of it. Um, Could get Jitsi to do it. Okay, and this is the last. Don't even wonder. Don't don't bring Jitsi trying to fix this. And this is the last payload that I have to show. Um, and what this does is you might as well go through. Uh, what it does is it gets information about the target Linux machine, and specifically target Debian. So if I pick Linux, it, any Debian base works. Um, and what it does is it runs a bunch of commands and then exfiltrates that data onto the uh, bad, onto the bash money. So it opens up command prop, runs xterm, or any terminal, you can change that to whatever you want. And then does this, and it's over. So that's the entire attack. You move it over to the other machine. I hope like how it worked because demos. Did you have sudo with no password needed? Uh, I'm not sure. Which means yes. Which means yes. <laughs> <laughs> because it, and at least the default configuration of Ubuntu is that it, it um, took elevated into sudo, you didn't need to use a password. Loads. Um, no, this one did not work. It's Linux. Yeah. And that's kind of the have on payloads, unless I want to try that one again. Um, but you can write a bunch of other scripts for this. There's other things you can do with it. Uh, some people say automated IT task, and that just sounds like uh, no. Um, doesn't seem like a good idea. Are you saying backups? That's, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, User profile backups. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's the end of the demos. That's kind of supposed to be the end of the presentation. I do have other information. But these are just on other uh, devices. You do God no wet Wi-Fi DR thing. <laughs> it's hard enough keeping Wi-Fi up. Uh, <laughs> if y'all want me to go over them, that's up to y'all. Are there any questions specifically? Are any questions? Have you unmuted um, Ben? You muted? No, you muted him early. Ben, do y'all have any questions? I think he unmuted. I don't think so. Shall we keep going? Great presentation. Would you like Caleb to keep going? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, absolutely. Go right. ahead. All right, so the other devices that are made by Maltronics and Hack5, uh, this is the, the author. There are two models of it. Uh, the OLED, which is the one with the little screen, it's uh, you can select the attack with the little rocker switch on top and press in to select what you want to do. Uh, the other one, the white one, what it does is you plug into a USB power source and then it makes a uh, a hotspot. You can then connect that with your phone and then the all things. So you can plan it, plug it up to a battery, plant it somewhere, and then the all things that are local to it. 
And then the watch is literally the uh, OLED with a wrist strap. <laughs> Uh, Mountronix Wi-Fi Keylogger. This is a keylogger that connects to Wi-Fi hotspot, and then the Pro version um, allows email recording, so you can actually send um, emails from it, from what I understand, and you can send those with the keystrokes that it found, but you have to connect to a, a local Wi-Fi access point in order for it to send stuff. And do these things have a, an arming switch on them also? They do not. Okay, so well, how do you... This does, this is just plugged into one end. You there's no programming, it, it comes from the pack. Or... It does it, yeah. There's no, uh, this one you can actually set up uh, via web UI, and you connect to it, and then it has some defaults. Uh, you can actually change the password and things like that on it, but other than that, that's kind of it. Okay. Uh, the Hack 5 Shark Jack, this has just come out within the last two or three weeks. Um, this is a network attack tool, so they say, and it is a RJ45 connected to a Linux box. Um, I haven't seen a ton of payloads for it. The one that is common is an MMAP payload. I wonder if it's PoE. Uh, I'm not sure, but it does have a battery on the back of it, so you can run it anywhere. And then it has a couple of switches on it, uh, two different things. I think one's off, so it doesn't drain the battery. One's just arming, and then the other one is uh, attack. This is the Hack 5 Cream Scrap. This seemed like the absolute most useless thing on this list. Um, it is a video in the, it's a video man the middle implant that requires Wi-Fi access, and then once it has Wi-Fi access, it can take screenshots, it cannot stream video, and it has to have a very strong Wi-Fi connection in order to take and send the images, or else it takes forever because it takes an AP or 4K, I think, uh, HDMI, but it cannot stream video. It can only take screenshots and send them over a cloud program that they have made called Cloud C2. Uh, the Hackbox Signal Owl, this is a signals intelligence platform. So this is an implant that you're tend to leave there and just be part of the office then. Uh, it has Aircrack NG, MDK4, Kismet, and a few other tools on it. But the idea is that it's there to monitor what's going on in the airspace, not necessarily to attack. The attack comes later with the uh, Wi-Fi pineapple. Uh, the packet squirrel, this is a man in the middle. On the other side of it, it just has a, another ethernet port. Uh, it can capture packets. It can also work as a hardware VPN, I mean, hardware VPN firewall. So you can plug this in and you would automatically VPN everything to another location. You use this. Um, Kind of to keep privacy in a way, but you require Ethernet connection everywhere you go. I'm glad I work at home. <laughs> so, uh, Hack 5 Land Turtle. This is a USB Ethernet device. Uh, there's two models a 3G one. The 3G one it has a, you can add a SIM to it and you can connect to it over the SIM, from what I understand. Um, this is a man middle network implant, so after you have it, you can then connect back. You could run in map, you could do things to the uh, computer plugged on onto the other side, or you can do things to the network plugin. So, the USB is just for power, and USB is just for power. Um, I'm not sure if you can run attacks over the USB, but I know you can do things the network has this going through anyway, or you can do, for instance, like DNS poisoning or things like that. And the four, 3G would allow you to do that from anywhere, and you would always have a way into the network. Uh, the Hack 5 Plunder Bug, this is a LAN type made for your phone. Uh, so you can plug this in, plug it to Ethernet jacks, has a USB-C, you plug that into your phone. Uh, it only has an app for Android right now. I don't know if they would ever make one for Apple. They may not get so, the hardware access if they need on Apple. So. Uh, the Hack 5 Wi-Fi Pineapple, most of you probably know what this one is. Uh, it's a rogue access point and Wi-Fi pen testing tool. There's two models, the Tetra and the Nano. Uh, the Tetra is dual band. It has 5 and 2.4, whereas the Nano only has 2.4. Um, and you can do mostly rogue access points or attack Wi-Fi or you know, other things like that, uh, DAW, stuff like that. And the last thing I have on the list is a Mousetronics USB protector. Uh, power pass-through only, no doubt. USB condom. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then questions on any of those. I can answer some questions on all of those, but I don't know a ton about all of them. There's a new one. Uh, it's called, if I figured it out, it's this one. 
Uh, oh, the Ponagachi. Yeah. Yeah, the so kind of cool. interface and it kind of interacts with other things. Wait, 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 wait. So the Ponagachi is a Tamagotchi that tries to learn how to hack into Wi-Fi networks around it. It uses AI and it tries to capture shapes and things like that on local Wi-Fi networks. And the idea is that you would plug into a battery, throw it in a book bag. As it gets happy and finds new networks, it smiles and puts a face onto it like a Tamagotchi would. As it gets <laughs> and learns more things. How much is that? Like, you uh, can go out of the Raspberry Pi W, I think. Okay. Yeah. To get sent out over the mail. Yeah, there's a project where you can just download it on GitHub, a uh, Git project, and you oh, load it into your own. Oh, so much fun. <laughs> uh, and you just load it into the Raspberry Pi. It does require you to have a uh, paper display or even display. Right. And the idea behind that is even when it's off, and then you say it's your little Tamagotchi face. Yeah. So it has instructions. Yes. There's, it has very detailed instructions. I think now you can just image it onto a uh, micro SD card and it does everything for you. And then you can connect back, and they can also talk to each other over a network and learn things from each other, from what I understand. Yeah. Whenever it connects to Wi Fi. It's nineties version of pet. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. I think everyone itself needs one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean the password is written on a piece of paper that's everywhere, so you don't need to guess the Wi Fi password. No, but if we want to break everybody's uh phone hotspots. <laughs> As a way to encourage them to not use their phone hotspots. This is spots. not DEF CON, okay? <laughs> I just politely <laughs> ask them not to. <laughs> that, that, that works. <laughs> when you're face to face with a human, sometimes politeness works. Sometimes. Well, if anyone has any other questions? Hearing none, thank you, Caleb. I think, I think we're good. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, not yet. I'm going to post it in the. Thank you very much. Okay. So I was. So Ben, are uh, are y'all going to have a meeting next month? Or are y'all going to the bar? Uh, we're just no. We're just we're just going to have a party. All righty. Well, then I guess we'll see y'all in January. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll see you in January. Thank y'all. I'll get this video edited and posted as soon as I can. Great. Thanks a lot. Good night, y'all. All right. See you guys. All right. Bye. Bye.